Welcome to the Anxiety at Work podcast. I'm Chester Elton, and this is my co-author and dear friend, Adrian Gostick. Hi, everybody. We hope that the time you spend with us today is going to help remove the stigma of anxiety and mental health in the workplace and your personal life. We invite experts from around the world of work and life to give us ideas and, most importantly, tools to deal with anxiety in our world. You know, in every life, you need a guide. And we, we are so fortunate to have our sponsor, Life Guides. Life Guides is a peer-to-peer community that helps people navigate through their day-to-day stressors by providing a place of empathy, listening, wisdom, and the support of a personal guide who has walked in your shoes, experiencing the same challenge of life and experience that you have. Your own personal guide. I love that, Adrian. Well, for our listeners, the offer for your team For you and to show that you care about your team, all you have to do is go to lifeguides.com forward slash schedule a demo and add the code healthy2021 in the free text box, free text box below, and you get two months of free service. Everybody needs a guide. Make your guide a life guide. Well, we are delighted to welcome to the podcast a dear friend of ours. Our guest today is our good friend, Rita McGrath. Uh, Dr. McGrath is a best-selling author, a sought-after speaker, longtime professor at Columbia Business School. She is widely recognized as a premier expert on leading innovation and growth through times of uncertainty. Rita has received the number one achievement award for strategy from Thinkers 50 and has been consistently named one of the world's top 10 management thinkers. Rita is the author of the best-selling The End of Competitive Advantage. Her new book is Seeing Around Corners. She received her PhD from the Wharton School. We are delighted to welcome to our podcast our good friend, Rita McGrath. Welcome. It's a pleasure to be here, you two. I'm, I'm just thrilled to uh, see your new book out in the world. Oh. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Rita. And it's so great to have you on the show. We really, as one of the world's experts on uncertainty, you know, we found that, look, this is one of the most off-sided sources of anxiety we heard, too, as we, as you said, we put our book out into the world. Now, I, I love, you know, I, as I did my background on you, I know we've known you for a while, but I did a little bit of background, and I know you started in strategy, uh, but I think the cool kids have now migrated to uh, to innovation <laughs> and uh, in all your world. So, you help uh, organizations through uncertainty while they're continuing to innovate. Now, but to say, to accomplish this, you say we as leaders have to uh, absorb as much uncertainty as possible. So help us understand that. Yeah. So what that means is as a leader, you're organizationally and hierarchically better off than the people reporting to you to take on the burden of possibly being wrong, to take on the burden of possibly not having all the answers. Uh, Because if you ask the people below you to take on that burden, they'll just freeze. They'll freeze in the headlights and you'll get back these totally dysfunctional responses. So let me give an example. Uh, I was working with a group in the insurance business launching a new product. And the important thing to know about insurance is it's regulated in the United States state by state. And so how big your geographic footprint can be when you launch is completely determined by how many state regulators have said, green light, you can market in our state. And so I'm having this conversation that I'm observing between the project manager and the operations guy who's responsible for making this all happen. And the project manager is basically saying, are you ready? Are you ready? And the operations guy is, well, I'm not sure. I don't know. You know, I think, I think we're all right. And, you know, given, and just waffling, like we're not getting anywhere. (laughs) Like we're not getting a yes. We're not getting a no. We're getting no information whatsoever, which is what happens if you force people into high anxiety situations. So we kind of, my colleague and I kind of pulled the project manager aside and we said, look, you know, you're asking him an impossible question. And he said, why? I said, because the big uncertainty here is we don't know how many states. So you've got to put a stake in the ground, say what you think the number of states is, and then ask him, is he ready? And so he said, all right, well, I'm not getting anywhere as it is. Maybe I'll give it a try. So he goes back and he says to the head of operations, well, say I told you to be ready for 15 states. Could you could you do that? And the guy was like, oh, absolutely, 15. We've even got a little spare capacity. I could move this. I mean, it was total clarity. Now, why I think that matters so much is not a single fact changed during that entire interchange. All that happened was the senior most person who was best able to bear the possible downside of something going wrong absorbed that uncertainty. He said, assume 15. So let's say it was 25 and the guy wasn't ready. 
it's no longer the burden on his shoulders anymore. He was told to be ready for 15 and he was ready for 15. And, you know, if it was a fiasco, not so. And if they only had to be ready for 10, he'd have been overprepared and that would have been fine. So it makes it a no-lose proposition for the people working for you. I love the no-lose proposition. <laughs> you know, Talk about reducing anxiety. Yeah, you're going to win no matter what. That's awesome. You know, one of our uh, favorite case studies in the book Anxiety at Work is one that you gave us with the Navy SEALs, the uh, taskers and the optimizers. Uh, walk us through that and how it can help us better understand dealing with overload uh, in the workplace. Yeah, so one of the things the Navy SEALs are famous for are these hazing rituals. They call it yeah. Hell Week. And these guys are just put through physical torture and, and they don't get to sleep and it's uncomfortable. And, and what they're really testing for is this commitment to teamwork, this presence of mind under pressure, the, the ability to cope with real horrible physical and emotional demands. And what they studied was the behavior of people towards these massively demanding and uncertain environments. And they found there were two kinds of people that tackled them. And so the first kind of person tried to optimize, right? They tried to figure out where they would best put their time and sort of think through how much energy should I put on this task and how much should I reserve for the last. And the taskers just kind of met the challenge that came at them, said, good, that's behind me, went to sleep, you know, got woken up when the next challenge was, tackled that, went to sleep. They sort of chunked it up much more, whereas the optimizers were trying to create a, a kind of a flow where no flow existed. And what they found uh, as they went back and studied this was that the optimizers didn't get enough rest. They were trying to impose certainty on an uncertain circumstance. And so instead of meeting the moment and overcoming it and moving on, they were just kind of moment to moment to moment and very stressed out by it. And I think that has metaphors, and not all of us are fortunately, under the stress of what being a Navy SEAL is all about. But, but all of us are faced with those kinds of situations where we have to decide, do I just grapple with the task at, at hand and, and get that behind me? Or do I really try to do a little bit longer term plan? And I would argue when uncertainty is really, really high, your taskers do better because they say, I know I can't plan. I'm just, I'm just going to acknowledge right here I can't plan. So I'm going to deal with what's right in front of me and step back and wait to see what new information comes after that. So how do you know, if I'm a leader, how do I know if somebody's a tasker or an optimizer? How do I help them, perhaps if they are more of an optimizer, in crisis, uncertain times, just eat a bite of the elephant at a time? How do, how do I know or, and how do I help? Well, I think Tom Kolditz wrote a definitive story about this in his wonderful book, uh, In Extremist Leadership. And he talks about what these leaders in very, very dangerous and unpredictable situations do. And the first thing that they do is they reduce the emotional temperature. So they don't add to it. They don't make everybody even more crazy, right? They say, no, 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 let's calm down. We'll take a deep breath. Let's step back. Second thing they do is they get their people involved in tasks outside themselves. So it's almost like, Adrian, you, you don't give them the choice. You say, okay, for the next 45 minutes, here what, here's what I want you to do. I want you to move this pen, you know, from point A to point B. And, and this is why I want you to do it. And when I learn more, I'll come back and tell you. So what you're doing is you're creating a tasking situation for your people because by, by protecting them from themselves almost. Um, and then the third thing that they do is they exhibit competence, right? They, they show, like, here's what we're going to do and here's why I think it's going to work. And all of this is built on a foundation of trust. And the way that uh, Tom talks about trust is you build up trust slowly over, over a long time. And you build up your trust bank in peacetime. And that's what helps you prepare for the hard times. Uh, that's so true. I love that idea. You build up trust so that when you do get it, then we will all get into these times. So another thing you talked to us about was this idea of prioritizing. I love the uh, metaphor you used of, of sort of boxes on a truck, which uh, I, I've, I've since used. But help us understand how to apply this. And, and you know, tell, tell us about that story of the visiting professor, too, when you were at Wharton. Oh, it was a great old story going back to my early days with uh, Ian McMillan, who was my uh, professor, my counselor, my mentor at Wharton. And I worked in his entrepreneurial center. And as it happened, I was in charge of the major research program there. So a lot of PhD students, this is how they earn their way through graduate school. You know, we take on research jobs or something like that. And my job was to look after the research program. So I supervised a whole team of undergrads and other master's students and researchers doing a variety of different projects. And uh, at the time, so I commuted about an hour and a half to get to Philly. I live in Princeton, so I was commuting. I had little, little kids. Um, and I think I, I think I just had our son when, when I was at that time. And so he would have been two, right? So I had a two-year-old, a long commute, 
visits to campus. And so my point is just like I was busy. I'm not whining, but it was it was busy. So I would plan my day on campus for those days that I was there. And it was every minute was accounted for because I was running this research program and I had to meet with the undergrads and I had to do all these things. And so show up one morning ready to dig into my day. And Mac turns up with this visiting scholar from I think it was Singapore. And he says, I'd like you to meet Dr. Boxing Kong from Singapore National University, a very esteemed person. This is great. And here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to uh, take him uh, to a couple of classes in the morning. And then here's a here's a chit for lunch at the faculty club. Treat him to a really nice lunch at the faculty club. And then we've got a visiting scholar giving a presentation in the afternoon and then you know he's set to meet with with Ned Bowman or somebody at the end of the day and I'm looking at him and you could just imagine what's going on behind my eyes I'm like like my whole day that I have spent a week planning for what's going to be accomplished this day it has just gone up in smoke right so I said to him lovely to meet you you know doctor whoever you were um Matt could I just talk to you for a sec and we said we went in the other room I said I get it. If you think the most important thing I can do with this day is this activity of entertaining this visiting scholar, if that's really what you think I should do, that's okay. But let me explain to you all the things that are not going to happen if I have to do that today. And he had no idea. I mean, he had no idea. The metaphor that we came to use was, it's like my day is like a truck and there's the truck is full. I've planned it all. It's all there. And so if somebody wants to add something in addition to the truck, it's not that I automatically say no, because maybe that is really important, but let's have a mutual conversation about what comes off the truck. <laughs> and so he had no idea. So his eyes were big and round. And basically what he was trying to do was get this guy on my truck and off of his truck for the day. <laughs> So we figured out a way of getting his chief of staff and one of the visiting scholars to accomplish effectively the same thing uh, that would have would have led all the way through that. So I think that's a really wonderful metaphor of how do you develop these contracts for mutually agreeable uh, activity where, you know, the stuff comes off the truck and you, you decide you make a conscious decision about what's coming and going from your truck. That's a great metaphor. I love that. You know, uh, one of the things that we've written a lot about uh, and has gotten a lot of traction is this idea of perfectionism, mm -hmm. perfectionism in the workplace. And you say that leaders can help people work through their fear of failure, but they have to develop a learning on the go culture. I love mm -hmm. that. Can you explain what some of the key features of this kind of culture is and how it can actually reduce anxiety? So I think the, the the fear of not being perfect comes from the kind of leadership that sort of says, well, why does spreadsheets, you know, sell E4 and not, not have the same value as spreadsheets <laughs> sell W22X? Um, and, and that's just the wrong discipline to impose on people when things are highly uncertain. So I'll give a couple of examples. Um, in In the world of sort of PR, you know, I decided to, um, oh, I'd really like to see about a subscription offer. And so my team kind of got on it and, and figured out what the right platform would be and how you could get that to happen and everything. And so four weeks later, we had a subscription offer. Now, was it elegant? No. Did the, the whole PR machinery around it unfold in this beautiful symphony? No. Did, did we make a bunch of mistakes? Did we publish some stuff in a weird place? Did we get the headline for newsletter A mixed up with the headline for newsletter B? Totally. But we now have a subscription offer where we didn't before and and I, I'm totally cool with the 25% of stuff that whoa we got to fix that but the 75% of let's get this in the world um, happened and and you know I think that's where you need to have your bias for better to have something in the world that's a little imperfect as long as it, you know I'm not talking about anything dangerous or, or something that's right. really harmful but you know if you're talking like a business problem um, let's get it in the world and let's let the world help us make it better um, rather than let's hang out in our cave, you know, waiting to, for the perfect blossom to emerge. And by then, you know, the world may have changed outside the cave and you don't even know it. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. We, we uh, once met a, uh, a mountain climber, very famous. And he says, you know, he says, it's amazing how many climbers stay at the bottom. They try and plan all their route and said, you know, the best of us, you get on the wall and you start climbing. And yeah, you might reach and you might have to work your way back, but you're up and you're moving. Mm -hmm. And he says, that's how you climb the mountain. And you know, so, Adrian, it kind yeah. of reminds me of, you know, getting in motion is so important. I'll never forget, you know, my dad, we were on a trip and I said, uh, are we lost? He goes, maybe, but wherever <laughs> we're going, we're making great time. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, Rita. Now, uh, before we, uh, I, I've got another question for you, but I, I want to find out or have our listeners understand how they can find you, where where you would point them. Sure. Well, the first place 
to stop is probably readamagraph.com. That's my personal website, and there you'll find all kinds of stuff, downloadable content and links to articles and videos and all kinds of introductions to the world of Rita. And as you know, I've recently launched a sister company called Valise. So Rita is sort of about great ideas, and Valise is about great capabilities. And so on the Valise site, which is V-A-L-I-Z-E, we have a section called Deeper Dive, and if this kind of stuff intrigues you, again, we have links to articles, lots of videos, instructional things you can look at. Um, we've got some downloadable um, tools that you can use. And so that's another good place to visit and see what we're up to. As if you're not busy enough teaching at Columbia, <laughs> book writing, uh, one business, now a second business. That, uh, yeah, boy, do you know about uncertainty. That's awesome. Uh, you, you know, you've, you've written quite a bit in HBR, especially about... You know, this idea of what, what business people do in uncertainty, whether you're a small business person, whether you're running a division or a big company, a lot of people seem to be a little frozen in the headlights. They get paralyzed. And a lot of time it's the fear of failure, maybe the lack of trust that you talked about. Um, you know, of course, in this economy, inaction is understandable. But for those who face fear and get stuck, um, how can leaders prevail in uncertain times? I know you've you talked about some practices leaders can use to to get yourself and people moving again. So mm -hmm. maybe talk about that if we feel stuck right now. Yeah, I think the best thing to do when you're stuck is to do something. And whether that's a small thing or whether that's a somewhat more aggressive thing, I think it's it's taking a step into what could be the future. And the way I talk about this is think about checkpoints, right? So I've got an idea that, you know, three years from now, the world could look a certain way. Well, how would I determine whether that makes sense or not? Well, rather than take the whole plan and try to plan it all out, like our like our optimizers, right? What, what maybe you should do is pick something small that you could actually test out with perhaps a couple of customers that isn't too much of a stretch and that isn't too much of a downside if it doesn't work out the way that you expected and treat it as an experiment. I think that's really where I would start, which is something small, something doable, where you can frame it as an experiment. And if that's successful, then you can see what that taught us and then you can take the next step. And this is really helpful for your people as well. Um, I think one of the things leaders tend to do when they're in high uncertainty is they they know they've got all this experience and all this gut and all this richness, you know, and so they kind of step in in front of their people. They don't let their people try things for themselves because either they're scared or they're uncertain or they're in a rush or whatever. And that just undercuts the capability building process. So what you really need to be thinking about is how do I frame the situation so the downside is, is protected and so that people directionally know where they want to go, but where I can let them have the actual experience of rising to this challenge and overcoming it rather than shortcutting it and doing it for them. Excellent. Excellent. You know, it, it is so interesting just getting in motion, right? A small task. It's an experiment. Let's get moving. Yeah. You know, I, I think one of the, the tough things that happens uh, around uncertainty is letting go of past mistakes and trying to envision that better better future. Isn't it though, isn't it human nature to dwell on those mistakes and, you know, and, and hesitate on envisioning the future? How do you get people to let go and move on? Because, and, and by the way, I want to take copious notes on this because I have a real tough time in letting go of past mistakes. And isn't it funny, even when you thought you've let go, there are those moments where it all comes rushing back. Yes. So coach me up, doctor. <laughs> oh, sure. So it's a bit like the old joke about, you know, how many Southerners does it take to change a light bulb, right? <laughs> and uh, how many does it take? Well, it takes about 20. It takes, um, it takes one to change the light bulb and 19 to talk about how good the old one was. <laughs> 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 Which is not meant to be dismissive of Southerners and, at all, yeah. but it's, it's sort of this hunger for nostalgic, this long, this reliance on the past. I think the first thing you want to think about is a concept I call forward only thinking, which is if I were to stop the world today and somebody else were to take over my body, you know, and I were just an observer for the next half day, you know, what would they do if they came into this whole situation fresh and had to make decisions based on where I am right now? What would they do differently? So that that's one uh, that I can recommend. And it's forward only thinking. It's the past can be lovely memories, um, but it's the past. Sometimes a symbol can help. Um, so a symbolic uh, shift, a symbolic burial, you know, um, so at a corporate level, I had a I had a client who's whose company was uh, the product of a merger of three different companies and they had never gelled. 
let's say they were yellow, red, and blue, right? And you'd have conversations about the blue people would say, ugh. Well, of course they said that. She's yellow. You know how that goes. And so there's a new CEO comes in and he's like, wait, this merger happened 10 years ago and you people are still in each other's throats. So he said, all right, we got, we got, to, we got to break this, right? And I'm going to do something symbolic to break it. And what he did was he sent out a note every, uh, on a Friday, on a Friday. And he said, okay, anything that anybody has in the office, I don't care if it's tchotchkes, yugas, awards, employee of the month, anything you want from the previous entities that we were created from, you take it home. Because if it is here over the weekend, it is going to disappear. And uh, so a lot of people ignored him. They were like, yeah, 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 corporate speak. And then they, they, didn't, they didn't pay attention to him. So he took his senior team, so his senior team of about 15 people, and they went through the building top to bottom every cubicle, every door, every everything with like a like a shopping cart. Um, and they took all of that stuff, all of those totems and, you know, yugas and t-shirts and you, know, you name it, um, and put it in this shopping cart. And then he had ordered, and this was for the Monday, he'd ordered a coffin to be placed <laughs> on the center of the conference table uh, on the following Monday. And he wow. video streamed this, like the whole organization. He put all, they had he had his team, all his team, because they were split too, right? They were all yellows and reds and greens. And so he had his team each put, you know, the items from the previous administration inside the coffin and he gave them each a hammer and a nail and they literally had to nail oh. the coffin shut. Nail and it got it wheeled shut. out of the conference room and he was like, okay, that's that new day. Now we start. Now that's a little dramatic and that's not going to work for every culture. But I think as an individual, you can make a symbolic break. You can say, okay, how do I, let me spend two weepy mornings on the sad movie looking at all those things that happened and I'm going <laughs> to clean up my clinic, move them out of the way. And um, okay, I'm going to clear the desk and get started on what's next. And I think sometimes you have to give yourself permission to mourn a bit, but then, you know, like, let's move on. Love that. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah, as, as our good friend Marshall Goldsmith says, is just move on. Yeah, I, I remember, yeah, CEO, we, we read about that just, you know, ripped out the uh, the parking lot uh, uh, entrance, uh, you know, whatever it is, the little, you know, arm, because the employee said, why do we have this? It's a remnant of the old world. They said, who's coming to our building and parking unless yeah. we want them there? And so it was just the symbolic. I love that idea of the symbols that can be very powerful, Rita. That's yeah. so great. Right. So yeah, can I well, give you another one that I asked? Yeah, love yes, it. Love it. Absolutely. So this is, and, and it shows how these things hang around, right? Long after they're no longer appropriate. So one of my clients is Goldman Sachs, and they just moved to this brand spanking new gorgeous building. But of course, the new building came after 9-11. And once we had 9-11, you know, you had guards on the floors of every building you had to be signed in. So anybody who was actually in the building was okay. They, they'd already been screened and anybody suspicious had been stopped. But for the previous 80 years, Goldman Sachs had had this policy that all the restrooms had entrance keys, right? Mm. And so if you were a visitor to Goldman Sachs and you happened to be a lady, you would have to go get the code to the ladies' room from whoever had it in the, in the you know, steno pool or whatever uh, to let yourself in. And so their, their head of operations, who's this absolutely brilliant guy, says to me, so we were about to install these key codes in all the laboratories, you know, in the new building. And I stopped them and said, hang on, we now have full on security, like at the ground floor. Nobody who's on any of our customer facing floors is going to need. To, why are we doing this? <laughs> Just we always did it that way. We always had key codes to get into the bathroom. Right. And I'm sure the guy said, it's just another level of security code <laughs> that is completely unnecessary. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But I thought, you know, it's such a it's such a day-to-day yeah. -day illustration yeah. of how these things just stick with you if you don't actually think about them. If you don't push that, which is kind of probably the last question I want to ask is, question we're getting asked a lot, and I'd love your thinking on the future of work. If you have your crystal ball, which actually people pay you to have a crystal ball <laughs> is five, 10 years out. Well, you know, what's the tale from this pandemic? What's the tale from kind of remote work, everything that's going on? What are you seeing right now that you're advising your clients to say, be aware of this, this, and this, because this is what the future of work looks like. Yeah, well, I think this is one of those great scenarios where prediction is going to serve you less well than preparedness. And I think what I tend to do is take two or three or four scenarios and then see which ones are sending me stronger signals as more information comes in. So there's one really strong signal, which is 
echoed in the popular imagination. Ah, the office is done. It's sweatpants forever. And right. So that's one camp. And then there's another camp that's like, oh, no, 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 no. It's butts in seats. Right. And we need to get back to corporate culture. And that's what we need to have. And then there's this weird amalgam of stuff in the middle, which is maybe a little in the office, maybe a little at home, maybe this, maybe that. Um, And I think what's probably going to emerge from those is some mishmash none of us have ever thought of. So all those butts in seats CEOs. Yeah, that'll be great until they lose the top 12 people they've just spent millions of dollars recruiting last year because they're like, I'm going to commute and sit in an office all day with headphones on to do coding. I don't think so. Thank you very much. <laughs> and so I don't think that policy is going to survive first crash with reality. And I don't think the people that are like, oh, we're all going to be remote because because there's a lot that we've lost by being remote. So I think we're going to get a lot uh, smarter. I think the things you can count on is whatever comes next, we're going to have to be much more deliberate about it than we were when we could just count on everybody blundering into the office at the same time. And that applies whether it's hybrid, whether it's wholly in person, whether it's partly in person. We're going to have to think about that, you know, and a lot of companies in the recession, let's not forget that, sorry, in the pandemic, a lot of companies in the pandemic have hired people who physically cannot be commuters to the office. So they have already, without anybody really making a big policy about it, they've made a commitment to a remote workforce. At some level. And so I think I think there's there's you can really predict the companies that are going to do well are the ones that are being thoughtful about it. Now, if you're going to be a butts in seat seven hours, you know, seven days a week kind of place, then I think if that's the kind of person you want to attract, be honest about it. Be upfront. There may be people to whom that is very attractive. Fast track, get ahead, heads down, you're, you know, you're cheek by jaw with the decision makers, adrenaline going 12 hours a day if that's what you want. This is the place you should work. If you're kind of a work-life balance, I'd like to take a walk and listen to the birds on the lunch hour. Not the place for you. And I think that's a perfectly legitimate choice, but I'd, I'd prefer people make it explicitly than that they just kind of blunder around assuming everybody knows what's going on when they don't. Ah, clarity. you got to love it. <laughs> I mean, we shouldn't be having to, to teach this concept, but you're exactly right. We do, because so many of us get so busy and we forget these, uh, you know, as we say, it's common sense, uncommonly practiced. So, you know, thank you, Rita, for your such valuable work on uncertainty and innovation. You know, if you have, if any of our listeners haven't checked out one of Rita's books, please pick them up. They, they are a treasure trove. Um, this has been such a great discussion, Rita. Now, if you had to summarize a couple of ideas you'd like people to take away from our conversation today, what would you say? So the first is that we're in uncertainty and you can't opt out. Sorry, no, not a choice. <laughs> Everybody's in the same boat. Uh, so learn to use the tools of uncertainty, and they come from the world of innovation. And what people don't understand is it's a discipline. It's it's different than what we're used to, but it's a discipline. So you can you can get smarter about that. You can learn about that. And probably a good place to start is my previous book, Discovery Driven Growth. That's a good place. Um, the second thing is that we know uncertain circumstances are not necessarily dangerous circumstances. They're just circumstances where we're not quite sure what the outcome is. So I think if you approach it in this um, episodic way, like like in small bites, rather than trying to eat it all off at once, um, like our taskers, uh, I think I think that'll be a much more productive way to approach it than trying to sort of absorb it all yourself and think about what the grand solution is. Excellent, excellent. Well, listen, we knew this would be a great fun. You you've got such a positive energy about you, Rita, and, and so <laughs> Thank accomplished. You. Thank you for taking the time and sharing what you know and and helping our listeners get through uncertainty, help them build a little resilience and at the same time get some stuff done. I love the rituals. Yeah, because, you know, let's face it, we're in business to stay in business, right? We got to get stuff done. Got to get stuff done at some point. (laughs) Got to pay the bills. Okay. (laughs) Thanks, Rita. This has been great. Thanks, guys. Lovely to see you again. Adrian, Rita McGrath. 15 pages of notes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how cool. The folks we get on our podcast here, Rita McGrath, you know, a renowned professor at Columbia Business School, who really is one of the world's experts on uncertainty. And, you know, first thing she says is, look, we as leaders, we've got to absorb much of the uncertainty for our people. We're putting it on them and it's not fair. Yeah. And be really specific. I loved her example in the insurance company. Uh, a general question like, are you ready? There's too much ambigu- ambiguity. There's too much uncertainty. I don't know what that means. Are you ready? Ready Ready yeah. for what? And when they got much more specific, uh, it was uh, everybody wins. It was a no-fail situation. 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, she, she taught us this idea of the taskers versus the optimizers yeah. at uh, the SEALs, uh, Navy SEALs Hell Week. But I've also heard this from, you know, marathon runners who say, no, no, I look to the next point on the horizon. That telephone pole 200 yards away, that's what I'm working toward. I'm not working toward 26 miles, right? Bite at a time. Yeah. And creating those tasking situations. You know, one of the things that's really funny that I took away from this, and I've heard the SEAL story many times, is that the optimizers never got enough rest. And I thought about that. That's anxiety. That's, you know, it's you're yeah. going over in your head again and again and again, instead yeah. of the taskers that are going, oh, okay, time to sleep. Yeah. Got that done. Yeah, exactly. Time to sleep. Yeah. So then we moved into this idea of prioritizing, and it's such a, it bears repeating this idea of, you know, your day is a truck with boxes on it, yep. and, and you have to be honest with people. Now, she told a wonderful story about this professor coming in, but, you know, the only reason she was able to have that conversation with her manager about, hey, if I do this, this is going to happen, is that there was trust in right. the relationship. And so I loved what she said is you build trust up before the crisis hits. Yeah, yeah. And then small and doable tasks. I love that. You know, uh, just get started. You know, you were saying get on the wall. I'll tell you the thing that I loved right at the end was that forward only thinking in allowing to let go from the past. And then those symbolic gestures, you know, the the coffin. Are you kidding? How great is that? Everybody comes to work. And And then they nail the coffin shut. Yeah. It just, you know, like she said, that doesn't work for everybody. That would totally work for me. Yeah. <laughs> I would I would love that. Well, and you could just see it being brought up over and over again with, you know, somebody. But, hey, back in 2011, we tried that. Uh, you know, Ted, do you not remember the coffin? Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, yeah, you could just yeah. see that being brought up. So, so I love that idea. Um, you know, so many good stuff. I, I mean, I really liked, you know, like, like you said, that forward only thinking, but also... What should we do as managers? We frame the situation so that people, you know, feel positive about where they're going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I think that the, the, the going to her websites and the stuff that she's creating, I mean, she's so generous with all of that. If you haven't um, researched Reader McGrath, you should do it. It's, it's well worth your time. Well, you know, we always love to give a shout out to our Life Guides uh, sponsor, you know, it's really interesting. I, I, I keep thinking, you know, Rita is a life guide for so many people. You know, mm-hmm. walked in their shoes, can give you great advice. Well, you know, Life Guides is this peer-to-peer community. It helps people navigate through their day-to-day stressors, giving you a personal guide that's walked in your shoes and experienced the same challenges you have. And they've given us such a generous offer to show that uh, you care about your team and that you want them to navigate through all this uncertainty. All you got to do is go to lifeguides.com forward slash Schedule a demo, add the code HEALTHY2021 in the free text box to receive two months of free service. And all of this will be in the show notes, by the way. Rita's uh, websites, Life Guides, the offer, it'll all be there for you. Sorry, I've got an ambulance going by. <laughs> Special thanks. I'll Hang take on. that. Hang on. It's almost gone. They're almost there to get you. Well, we want to give a special thanks to everybody who puts this show together, especially Brent Klein, our wonderful producer, Christy Lawrence, who finds all these amazing guests, and especially for all of you who have listened in. If you like the podcast, please share it. We'd also love you to join our online community, wethrivetogether.global, where we're creating a safe place to talk about anxiety and mental health in the workplace. Well, we'll see you again in about a week with any kind of luck. Adrian, close us out. Oh, well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. If you are if you enjoyed this, please download the podcast so we can continue building up this, this movement around removing the stigma of mental health at work. We encourage you to check out our new book, Anxiety at Work, and thank you, everybody. We wish you the best of mental health this week. Take care and be well. <laughs>